governs, and she never governs wisely. The colonies are not to be emancipated. All men are created equal, victory or death. In the early years of the Revolution, Washington fought a skillful defensive war. His army and his nation had survived. But when France entered the conflict in 1778, the tables turned. The struggle had become part of a global chess game. Britain no longer simply had to subdue her rebellious American colonies. She had to protect other interests abroad as well. And she had to survive. Nevertheless, Britain still saw rich opportunities for winning what the English called the War for America. West Point was called throughout the revolution the key to the continent. If there was one spot, one geographic location anywhere in the colonies, that could be decisive toward the outcome of the war, it was West Point. The British thought if they could control it, they would win the war. The Americans thought the same thing, that if the British ever controlled West Point, the Americans would lose the war. After the French entered the war for America's independence in 1778, British strategy shifted towards dominating the southern colonies and the protection of the West Indies. But a golden opportunity still existed for winning the war in the North, an opportunity involving the vital Hudson River and West Point that could be made possible only through the treason of one of America's most successful generals, Benedict Arnold. The Hudson River basically bisected the population. Half the Americans lived to the East, half lived to the West. The Hudson runs directly north out of New York City the Americans couldn't cross it, there were no bridges, it was a completely unfordable river. In the face of a British Navy, if the British Navy had been able to run up and down the Hudson River, they would have effectively uh, cut the colonies in two. Trade would have been cut off. Washington could not have maneuvered his army. About 50 miles above New York City, a point of land reached out into the river from the western shore, West Point, the future site of the world's premier military academy. Just above West Point lay Constitution Island, jutting out into the river from the east. As it goes around West Point, the river makes two 90-degree turns in a very tight area. And the river is at its narrowest point there. A sailing ship in that day and age couldn't sail around West Point. Warships or trading ships, when they got to that point, would have to stop, get a rowboat out front with sailors, and pull itself around the point. 
The Americans felt that artillery stations placed on West Point and Constitution Island would have a good chance of stopping British warships attempting to drive upriver. But to completely thwart their opponents, they turned to a visionary, ambitious feat of engineering. The rebels forged a 65-ton chain and spanned the 600-yard-wide Hudson with it. The 114-pound links floated on 12 by 16-foot rafts. In 1778, they first stretched the chain from a fortified cove on West Point to another fortified cove on Constitution Island. The chain would stay in place until 1783, being removed only in the winters when ice solidly locked the Hudson. At either end of the chain, they put artillery pieces. So a ship trying to be towed up would snag on the chain and the artillery at almost point blank range right there would blow it to bits. Then to protect that, they built a series of forts in a circle. Then to protect those going farther up in the mountains, they built another ring of forts. So you have several concentric rings of defenses. Made that complex in in the war of that time, impregnable. But that which could not be attacked from without might be attacked from within. In May of 1779, Benedict Arnold covertly contacted the British High Command in America and offered his cooperation on some unspecified plan that could cause the fall of the rebel government. But the seeds of his treason had been germinating for several months. And during the next year, they would continue to grow. After the British gave up Philadelphia in 1778 because of France's entry into the war, Arnold, the wounded hero of Saratoga, became that city's military commander. Although never known as a wealthy man, he proceeded with plans to buy this residence, the country estate of Mount Pleasant, one of the finest mansions in America. While he was there, he met and married Peggy Shippen, uh, a very young, vivacious, outgoing young lady who had connections with the British. Her family was a loyalist family. Thirty-eight-year-old Arnold and eighteen-year-old Peggy entertained lavishly spending freely, often on parties for loyalists. It was too much for Philadelphia patriots to bear. The proud general was court-martialed in the winter of 1780 and found guilty of two charges of misconduct. His punishment was limited to a stern reprimand from Commander-in-Chief George Washington. But Washington also believed in Arnold and soon offered him a high field command. Arnold had other plans. He indicated that his leg had not healed, he was still a cripple, he had trouble riding a horse, he had trouble walking, and all that was, was still true. And he asked for the command of West Point. He told Washington that given his condition, that's where he thought he could serve best. At the same time, Arnold had been in secret communication with Sir Henry Clinton. He sent this coded letter to Clinton's aides on July 15th, 1780. Deciphered, it read, If I point out a plan of cooperation by which Sir Henry shall possess himself of West Point, the garrison, etc., 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 20,000 pounds sterling, I think, will be a cheap purchase for an object of so much importance. I expect a full and explicit answer. Benedict Arnold. Two and a half weeks later, on August 3rd, 1780, Washington made Arnold the commander of West Point, the key to the continent. Benedict Arnold's motives for trying to deliver West Point to the British are the subject of conjecture 
but his methods are well known. Arnold systematically weakened the post at West Point by sending troops off on all sorts of detached service. A lot of the garrison, of course, was already in encampments outside of West Point. Other troops were sent up the river to look for wood and other supplies, so the garrison was really under strength. Arnold's plan was designed that West Point would be at its absolute weakest when the British attacked. Arnold's connection to General Henry Clinton was John Andre, now serving as one of Clinton's key aides with the title of Adjutant General. Andre had been at the center of the British social whirl during the occupation of Philadelphia in the winter of 1777 and the spring of 1778. There he designed the extravaganza in Howe's honor called the Michianza. And there he had become good friends with a lovely young loyalist. Peggy Shippen, now Benedict Arnold's wife. The artistic young aristocrat had become an unlikely spy. Protected with a pass signed by Arnold and traveling under the pseudonym of John Anderson, Andre arrived at West Point past midnight on the 21st of September. John Andre had come up wearing his uniform to meet Arnold at night to discuss their plans, what Arnold was going to give him, how they would cooperate the takeover of West Point. They talked for a long time at night. The first rays of light came. Arnold told him to return by land, which Andre decided to do. But in so doing, he took off his uh, uniform coat and uh, was traveling as a civilian, which technically makes him a spy. The next morning, just a few miles from British lines, Andre was captured by Patriot sympathizing highwaymen. In his boot, they found detailed plans of West Point. They brought Andre to American Lieutenant Colonel John Jameson, who sent a message of the suspicious development to the commander of West Point, Benedict Arnold. Arnold looked at it, realized that he had been caught and he had to leave. He went upstairs, quickly told Peggy, his wife, that they were caught. She was very much involved in the treason, that he had to leave and she would have to bluff her way out. He went down to the river. He had a barge with soldiers that uh, rode him when he would go across to West Point. He had them take him down river south to the British lines, leaving uh, his aides and all the others uh, thinking he had gone to West Point. But the Arnolds had company that morning of September 24th. With no knowledge of the treason, George Washington had come to visit Arnold and to inspect West Point. He and his aides sat down to breakfast without Arnold or Peggy. Later in the day, another messenger arrived. This one bore the plans and information about West Point in Arnold's handwriting that had been found in Andre's shoe as well as a letter in which Andre identified himself as the mysterious man in captivity known to the Americans as John Anderson. Arnold has betrayed us. Whom can we trust now? George Washington. Peggy, who has known that Arnold was a traitor and now knows that Washington knows, starts having hysterics upstairs. She begins to cry that there's a hot iron on her head and they're going to take her baby away from her. Uh, she was either truly in the grips of hysterics or she was one of the best actresses going because when Washington, who had known her as a young woman, he had known the family, went up to see her, she convinced him that she was a, a very innocent person, that Arnold had been in that by himself, so he let her and the baby go in a carriage with his permission back to Philadelphia to her family. Washington increased security at West Point and its capture by the British was averted. John Andre was sentenced to death by hanging. The day before his execution, Andre drew this self-portrait 
British General Henry Clinton tried to bargain for Andre's release. But Washington would accept only one man in exchange, a man that Clinton refused to give up, Benedict Arnold. I am reconciled to my death, but I detest the mode. John Andre, moments before his death. While waiting and standing near the gallows, I observed some degree of trepidation, placing his foot on a stone and rolling it over and choking in his throat as if attempting to swallow. Dr. James Thatcher. Andre, dismissed by many as an aristocratic dandy, impressed those who witnessed his death by his quiet courage. Andre took off the handkerchief from his neck, unpinned his shirt collar, and deliberately took the end of the halter, put it over his head, and placed the knot directly under his right ear, and drew it very snugly to his neck. He then took from his coat pocket a handkerchief and tied it over his eyes. In a few moments, he hung entirely still, a witness at Andre's execution. The British were very bitter about this and said that no European state would have treated him as a spy. He was a negotiator. But it's a very uh, marginal thing, and one can't but understand why uh, uh, Washington took a different line and having convicted him of spying, uh, hanged him. He was in uh, civilian clothes in enemy territory and had been negotiating, of course, with the traitor, not with the American commander. Andre's body was eventually returned to England and entombed with British heroes at Westminster Abbey. His counterpart in America's most infamous treason would never be so revered by the British. The British viewed Arnold when he arrived from his treason with the sort of mixed feelings that one accords to a traitor, even if he's somebody else's traitor. If he can do that to them, may he do it to you. Treason by a committed revolutionary was uh, in a way suspicious in itself. They made him a brigadier general and uh, gave him a command in the Chesapeake at one time, but he never did a great deal and uh, was never, I feel, uh, really trusted by the British. George Washington and Benedict Arnold, both are leaders. They both, by virtue of their ability, do very well. They both suffer setbacks. They both have criticism to go with their laurels. The one with character, as he becomes more famous and is subject to more criticism, grows stronger and stronger and becomes eventually the father of his country. The other, under criticism and in the light of fame, grows weaker and weaker and eventually becomes a man without a country. The name Washington is loved, revered. The name Arnold is synonymous with treason. Two weeks after the Battle of Monmouth, the Comte d'Estaing brought his French fleet to the entrance of New York Harbor. Much of Clinton's army had boarded British ships under the command of Admiral Black Dick Howe, the brother of General William Howe. D'Estaing refused to attack this smaller British fleet for fear his large ships would be unable to negotiate the channel at Sandy Hook. Nearly a month later, as the two fleets finally prepared to meet off Newport, Rhode Island, a violent storm scattered the ships. The next time the great fleets would meet would be in the sugar islands of the Caribbean. But these were not the first sea encounters of the Revolutionary War. For although the American leaders had the resources to build only a fledgling navy, they knew of another way to motivate seamen. A privateer, 18th century, is 
licensed in time of war by its government to attack the shipping of the enemy. If you're a ship owner, perhaps your ordinary trade has been stopped by war, you've got a nice fast ship, you uh, arm her if she isn't armed already, you cram her full of men, and uh, you send her out to cruise in the likely track of the enemy shipping. The 18th century took it for granted that profit and patriotism went hand in hand. People didn't send privateers to sea for amusement. They sent them to sea in the expectation or in the hope of making money. During the course of the war, nearly 2,000 sea-raiding American ships took an $18 million toll on British commerce. It is by cutting off supplies, not by attacks, sieges, or assaults, that I expect deliverance from enemies. John Adams. After saving Washington's army in the dramatic night evacuation from Brooklyn to Manhattan in late August of 1776, and successfully ferrying the army across the ice-choked Delaware before the Battle of Trenton, John Glover and his marbleheaders heard the siren's call of wealth on the seas. Glover's regiment uh, pretty much uh, disappeared. They all went home to Marblehead and signed up on privateers because that was how you could make a fortune in the revolution. And, and all, in fact, Washington f frequently bemoaned the fact that he was having trouble recruiting men because half of New England was out on ships uh, raiding British commerce <laughs> and making a bundle. The Scotch-born seaman Captain John Paul Jones was part of the small official Continental Navy, but he still kept prizes like the privateers. His career is short but very spectacular. This is the period before France has entered the war. The main successes of people like John Paul Jones was not actually that they captured lots of ships, but they had a tremendous public relations impact and they did a huge amount to establish the rebel cause as being uh, a serious one. At the point when the rebels are desperate for foreign support, desperate to persuade the French and others that they're a cause worth supporting. Robert Morris, the so-called financier of the revolution, kept the Continental Navy afloat through his fiscal wheeling and dealing. Jones wrote him a letter in 1776 that clearly articulated his formula for a successful navy. The common class of mankind are actuated by no nobler principle than that of self-interest. Enlist the seamen and give them all the prizes. If our enemies, with the best established and most formidable navy in the universe, have found it expedient to assign all prizes to the captors. How much more is such policy essential to our infant fleet? John Paul Jones. By 1779, Jones commanded a slow French-built ship, the Bonhomme Richard, or Good Man Richard, named after Ben Franklin's creation in Poor Richard's Almanac. Franklin and Jones were friends, and the old diplomat gave the young sea captain many ideas for specific raids that would have the greatest propaganda values. In the Bonhomme Richard off the coast of England, Jones attacked a British convoy and achieved his most legendary success. He just managed to capture the Serapis, the frigate which commanded the convoy escort, just in time because his own ship actually sank under him in the course of the action. It was during this desperate engagement that Jones supposedly shouted the line that became a symbol of dogged tenacity, I have not yet begun to fight. It was a famous victory, of course, and it made tremendous newspaper headlines and a great sensation. From the strictly military point of view, it was a failure because the convoy got away. But from the psychological and political point of view, which was really what mattered at that point to the rebels, um, it, it was a great success and a very important one. If the rewards for civilian privateering were great, so too were the punishments. 
Captured privateers were held in several prison ships like the Jersey, anchored off of New York City, near Long Island. Since they were not officially recognized as true soldiers or sailors, the privateers were ineligible for prisoner exchange and would languish in the darkness until the war's end or death. There were continual noises during the night, the groans of the sick and the dying, the curses poured out by the weary and exhausted upon our inhuman keepers, the restlessness caused by the suffocating heat and the confined and poisoned air mingled with the wild and incoherent ravings of delirium were the sounds which, every night, were raised around us in all directions. Such was our ordinary situation. But at times the consequences of our crowded conditions were still more terrible and proved fatal to many of our number in a single night. Captain Thomas Dring, privateer, Nearly 11,000 Americans died aboard the Jersey and similar vessels off Long Island during the war. Although the privateers had their spectacular and much publicized successes, the real sea war took place between the great warships of the British, the French, and other European fleets. In the Western Hemisphere, their principal theater of conflict was the Caribbean, known as the West Indies. In the 18th century, especially the later part of the 18th century, wars between the European powers always get fought in the West Indies, as well as at home, because the West Indies are the seat of the richest trades in the world. These islands, especially the Sugar Islands, but not only sugar, also coffee, indigo, rice. These are very, very rich commodities. Even quite small islands are immensely valuable. There is Guadalupe, it's only 50 miles across, but it's the single richest colony in the whole world. There was no question that in financial terms, Guadalupe was worth 10 times as much as the whole of Canada. What is Canada in the 18th century? It's a vast frozen waste. It's nothing but snow and beavers. In, in money terms, there's simply no contest. Guadalupe wins hands down. The war had its own rhythm based on the seasons. And the campaigning seasons in the West Indies tended to be complementary to those in North America. During the summer, which was the prime campaigning season in North America, was the hurricane season in the West Indies. In winter, when it was difficult to fight in North America, was the prime campaigning season in the West Indies. So fleets and armies shuttled back and forth between North America and the West Indies, depending on the seasons. For four years after Destang sailed to New York, the British and French fought over the islands of the West Indies, so rich in commodities those countries treasured. Some of the islands were captured, lost, and recaptured by the warring nations. Tens of thousands of European soldiers swarmed over rich and strategically important islands. Spain joined the war in 1779 on the side of America and France, and at the end of 1780, Britain declared war on the Netherlands to stem that country's flow of arms and supplies to America through the Dutch island of St. Eustatius. In the early stages of the rebellion, the Dutch were the suppliers of gunpowder and guns and munitions, and they were supplied via some of the Dutch West Indies, above all the island of St. Eustatius. And so long as the Dutch were neutral, it was very difficult for the British to stop them. The only certain way of stopping the Dutch shipping supplies to the rebels would have been to declare war on the Dutch and make them enemies. And in the end, in fact, that was what the British did. It would be the combined naval strength of the French, the Spanish, and the Dutch that would finally overcome Britain's naval superiority. The American problem 
has, from this point on, has receded to the background. From the point of view of the British government, uh, and even more from the point of view of the French and Spaniards, this is a real serious war against first-class enemies. Uh, and what happens in the colonies on the other side of the Atlantic is a subsidiary issue. The goals of empire and the war spread far beyond America and the West Indies. In fact, the European powers continued to do battle over colonial prizes for two years after the fighting had ended in America. And the final shots of the war that had begun at Concord and Lexington were fired near Cuddalore, off the coast of southern India, in a battle that guaranteed Britain control of India in the 19th century. After France had entered the war in 1778, George III's minister responsible for the war in America, George Germain, searched for a new way to subdue the rebel states. Clearly, the attempt to do it by crushing New England hadn't worked. Now, Lord George concluded that what you needed was to reoccupy quite systematically, starting in the south, and moving north, and as you went, consolidate the gains by organizing and arming loyalist militias. The South was attractive to the British for other reasons as well. In order to effectively wage war in and control the West Indies, they felt they needed naval bases in the southern colonies. They decided to take Charleston, South Carolina, the fourth largest city in America. This decision would lead the British to one of their greatest victories, and finally to Yorktown and their greatest defeat. The first step in the British plan to subdue the South and gain Charleston involved the taking of the smaller port city of Savannah, Georgia. They accomplished that goal nearly effortlessly on December 29, 1778. But in September, the Comte d'Estaing with 4,000 French troops landed near Savannah to join a much smaller American force under Massachusetts General Benjamin Lincoln in an attempt to regain the city. The French commander treated Lincoln as an inferior. Their allied siege was a disaster, resulting in over 1,200 casualties. The Stang would return to the West Indies. The rebels would head to Charleston. To Charleston with fear, the rebels repair. De Stang scampers back to his boat, sir, each blaming the other, each cursing his brother. And may they cut each other's throats, sir. A Loyalist Ballad, 1779. De Stang's departure opened the door for Clinton. At the end of 1779, he sailed from New York for Charleston. By the end of April 1780, he had the entire Southern Army trapped there and bombarded them at will. Fatigue was so great that for want of sleep, many faces were so swelled they could scarcely see out of their eyes. General William Moultrie, But the rebels would not submit. On May 11th, negotiations between Lincoln and Clinton broke down, and both sides began a furious shelling. It was a glorious sight to see them like meteors crossing each other and bursting in the air. It appeared as if the stars were tumbling down, great guns bursting and wounded men groaning along the lines. It was a dreadful night. It was our last great effort, but it availed us nothing. General William Moultrie. It was the largest rebel surrender of the war 
the 2,500-man Southern Army and 800 militia. The Charleston expedition was originally mounted as part of a global strategy which was all directed against the French and Spaniards and was looking at the West Indies. But it was so successful that it persuaded the cabinet, British cabinet, to put a big army there. And I think this was a mistake. I think Cornwallis's troops might have been employed in a decisive theater, the West Indies say, instead of which they set off gallivanting around the back country of the Carolinas, uh, doing no particular good to the British cause, uh, and in the end, getting themselves into disastrous trouble. For the next year, the British just ran through the South. They lost a little battle here or there, but by and large, they were winning the war because they had the most fearsome cavalry officer of the war on their side. His name was Banaster Talton. And this man had an outfit called the British Legion, about 400 men, half on horseback, half on foot. And when he wanted to get his foot soldiers someplace in a hurry, they'd ride two men to a horse. And Talton would tear across the state. Just amazing the, the amount of ground he could cover. Talton wanted a victory at any cost. So he was a fearsome officer to his enemy. You knew if you faced Talton, you faced one of the toughest fighters of the British Army. Bannister Tarleton, the Green Dragoon, secured his fame forever when he and his British and Loyalist Legion came upon an American party in the North Carolina area known as the Waxhaws. He ignored their attempt to surrender and butchered them with saber and bayonet. Not a man was spared. For 15 minutes after every man was prostrate, they went over the ground, plunging their bayonets into everyone that exhibited any signs of life. And in some instances where several had fallen one over the other, these monsters were seen to throw off on the point of the bayonet the uppermost to come at those beneath. Dr. Robert Brownfield, a surgeon at the Waxhaws, Henceforth, was known in that part of the world as Bloody Tarleton, a man who gave, quote, Tarleton's quarters, quote, uh, and often referred to as the Butcher Tarleton. With Lincoln's surrender at Charleston, the Congress turned for help to General Horatio Gates, the commanding officer at Saratoga, who had received Burgoyne's surrender in 1777. He now had the unenviable task of stopping Cornwallis and his rampaging warrior, the Butcher Tarleton. He greeted his appointment as head of the Southern Army with little enthusiasm. It is an army without strength a military chest without money, a department apparently deficient in public spirit, and a climate that increases despondency. General Horatio Gates. In mid-August, the Southern Army under Gates met the British commanded by Lord Cornwallis near Camden in South Carolina. The British infantry, aided by Tarleton's legion, routed the Americans. Then Tarleton and his men chased the fleeing rebels through woods and swamps. Gates was among the swiftest in retreat. His actions would lead to his recall. It's where his reputation gained at Saratoga was erased by his defeat. And it was, in a sense, the final step in the British control of that part of the country. In the North, Washington had plenty of problems of his own. His army was grossly undersupplied and nearly starving, 
Just four days after the Battle of Camden, he wrote Congress. On the whole, if something satisfactory be not done, the army must either cease to exist at the end of the campaign or it will exhibit an example of more virtue, fortitude, self-denial, and perseverance than has perhaps ever yet been paralleled in the history of human enthusiasm. George Washington. With South Carolina lost and the Southern Department of the American Army in disarray, Cornwallis was poised to subdue the entire South and then join Clinton against a weakened Washington. Lord Germain's plan of conquest was working. To arrest the British juggernaut, the rebels needed a general to match Cornwallis and a warrior to match Tarleton. Fortunately for the American cause, Washington had them. While Cornwallis unleashed his devastating raids in Virginia, the British commander-in-chief, Henry Clinton, began to fear an American and French assault on his army in New York. So he decided that Cornwallis should go to Virginia's Yorktown Peninsula to await transport north to New York by the British Navy. That decision would lead to the final chapter of a long war and cost England the American colonies.